brothers and sisters, Baba Neil, and the Change Ensemble.
found a Reverend Al Sharpton, the flowers, where we can celebrate them here on earth. Not wait till the person is gone, because what Reverend Al Sharpton has meant to America is inarticulable. When you think about the people who never would have had a voice had he not thought it robbery to help give them a voice. So I thank Rev all the time, like every time I see him, I say thank you, Mentor, for being able to help those who have been marginalized, disenfranchised, and victimized, even when the TV cameras ain't nowhere to be found. National Action Network is always there. Amen? And I, I know today we're doing this national feeding program, uh, Vanessa Harris in legacy and memory of her daughter uh, is doing a single parents feeding initiative all around the country. And when she said she was coming to New York City, I said there's only one place that you have to come to when you come to New York City. If you're talking about getting to the relief of our people because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. National Action Network always have food giveaways by our people, always trying to help those in need, always trying to uplift the culture. So if y'all would, please give a big round of applause for Vanessa Harris, this young lady who from my heart is making a difference for single parents. And then, I told Dominique and, you know, Rev and I have been talking about it. One day, House of Justice, I'm going to call, and we ain't going to have no major controversy going on in America. <laughs> but unfortunately, yeah. actually, that ain't today. Because Attorney O'Neill, I hope that y'all are paying attention to the trial involving the killers of Ahmaud Aubrey, because we got to find out what's going on in Georgia. What's going on in Georgia? Because, yeah, you know, it's so crazy. I was on uh, the cable news shows last night, and I was talking uh, about the fact when you heard his lawyers saying that the reason Travis McMichaels did this white man who had all kind of racial appetites in his text messages, had the big Confederate flag on the front of his truck, chasing down a mod Aubrey mm. for almost two miles, back and forth as a mod was running for his life. It was so deep to hear his lawyer in court yesterday say, well, he was doing this because he was concerned about the safety of his five-year-old son. Yeah, right. And I scratched my head, I said, well, if he was worried about his son's safety, all he had to do was stay in his house and call 911. Why was he up here chasing this young black man for a jogging while black? Because as Marcus Aubrey says so passionately, they lynched my son. They lynched my son. Because, Corey, think about it. I mean, you got him on the back of the bed of the pickup truck with a shotgun. And there's a Confederate sign on the front of the truck. Now, Michael, if you saw some white man on a pickup truck with a shotgun with a Confederate flag coming towards you, what would you do? That's exactly what Ahmaud Arbery did. He started running, and then the lawyers for the killers of Ahmaud Arbery talking about, well, they just, he wouldn't stop. He, they just wanted him to stop. I mean, what kind of craziness is that? And, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the eerie similarities of this tragic killing of Ahmaud Aubrey yeah. in 2020. You know, a young man 
running away from white citizens who claim that they killed them as a result of self-defense under this citizen's arrest law yeah. that's only outdated. in Georgia. Very antiquated, outdated. outdated now, yeah. But it harkens back, Attorney O'Neill, to Trayvon Martin. Yeah. Yeah. When you had this teenage, young black boy, he wasn't a man, walking home, minding his own business, had a bag of Skittles and a can of iced tea, and then this neighborhood watch volunteer, this citizen, thought he was suspicious, just like they thought Ahmaud Arbery was suspicious. And then they start to chase him, <coughs> profile, pursue him, shoot him in the heart. And then what does he say? Stand your ground. And it's crazy because, you know, back then, white America wanted to try to accept that. His narrative, even though you had a, a dead black kid laying on the ground, unarmed, you had a grown man standing up, confessed to the killing, had the proverbial smoking gun still in his hand, and yet he got to go home and sleep in his bed at night. And, you know, in February it would be 10 years. Everybody in America is going to be saying, how far have we come since Trayvon Martin? It's going to be all over the news everywhere. And so I think this trial with the killers of Ahmaud Arbery going to tell us how far we've come. Because think about this, y'all. Think about this. The only difference, I believe, in many ways between the killing of Trayvon Martin and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery is video. We all got to see what happened to Ahmaud Arbery. And now that they have 11 white people and one black man on that jury in Georgia, we got to say what's going on in Georgia because it's clear as day to us. It was a lynching, just like his father said. It was murder, and we have to make sure that we get justice for a mild offering. Yeah. We got to have Reverend Al and National Network come back down to Georgia because shame on us, America, if we let this lynch mob get away with killing this unarmed black child. And what was his crime? Jogging while black. That's the only thing they got. And so, Dominique, I, I know we got to get ready to move on, but I, I just want you all to continue to keep talking about Ahmaud Arbery. Yeah. Attorney Merritt and I, we understood. I told him this is going to be like Trayvon Martin 2.0. Yeah. They assassinate the young black man, and then Attorney Michael Hardy, they assassinate his character. See, Reverend Allen, now we saw this in Sanford, Florida. And, you know, Trayvon Martin raised the consciousness level of black people in America. We kept saying Trayvon Martin life mattered. And from there, people started saying black lives matter. It was the impetus for black lives matter. And now here we are 10 years later, and everybody's going to be asking the question, how far have we come? You know, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. Uh, Blando Castile, Eric Gardner, Terrence Crutcher, uh, Botham Jean, Atiana Jefferson, Pamela Turner, all these eulogies that Reverend Al has preached. America, how far have we come in the last 10 years? Well, we going to know how much progress we made if those living white people and that one black man don't return a verdict on all three of the murderous lynch mob. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Thank you all for standing up for justice and for Amara Nava. His life matters. Attorney Benjamin Crump. Right now, brothers and sisters, if you are here, I want you to get on your feet. If you're at home, I want you to get on your feet and put your hands together for the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Justice. When do we want it? Now. When 
Saturday morning where the action is. Give a hand out, presider, attorney Michael Hardy. And doing our music today, our friend and brother, the one and only Bravon Neal. And you know, Bravon is the one that composed our theme song, Your Change Will Come. And that's He was here every Saturday, but he has to travel his own career. He worked with artists like Roberta Flack and on and on and on. So he's a celebrated artist, but when he can, he comes home and plays for us. Give him another hand. And suddenly we're warmed up and happy to have the Attorney General of Black America, Ben Crump, in the house. And o Attorney O'Neill, happy to have everybody. Thank you, sir. Y'all that was coming out here this Saturday morning, they knew y'all was gonna see Ben Crump. <laughs> but let me say this, and I wanna cover a lot of ground uh, in the next uh, moments we have on the air. Uh, ben Crump is, is united with this feeding initiative. Uh, that is here at the House of Justice today, and we're honored to have them, Spin Helps. And uh, they are giving out vouchers that you and I ought to support and celebrate. Uh, Vanessa Harris and Sheila Robinson are here today. Stand up, y'all. They're giving out vouchers for people to be able to 
uh, get groceries and sanitary items. And they'll be here all day uh, from 11.30 to 2 o'clock. Our uh, coordinator, Katrina Jefferson, is going to be working with them right here at the House of Justice. You that are listening on uh, Radio Land in the three-state, and the tri-state area, you that's watching us on television, obviously you that are in other parts of the country can't come. But you that need a voucher, come to the House of Justice, 145th Street and uh, Lenox Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard. And before uh, 2 o'clock, don't come 2.30 asking for your voucher. <laughs> 11.30 to 2 o'clock. Time don't go up to the night, so y'all got to be on time today. And we are celebrating this partnership with Shoe Cosmetics and attorney at Ben Crump's feeding initiative, SPIN, Single Parents in Need, nationally. And I, this, you know, Ben Crump getting the, so much stuff that he doesn't get credit for, but this is needed. There are a lot of people that need vouchers. We are in a time of need. And ain't no shame, and the shame is if you need it and don't get it. You know, I, I, I often talk about how when my father left and my mother had to raise us, my sister and I, on food stamps and welfare. And I never get, I used to try to hide on the other food stamps because I was shame of uh, my uh, fellow students going to school, knowing that we want food stamps. And I remember my mother told me one day, you think it's a shame to be on food stamps? She said, think about how shameful it's going to be you pull up to the table tonight and we ain't got no dinner. She said, that's going to be a shame. But the way you be swallowing that fried chicken, you get over your shame with the food stamps. So if you need vouchers, you need vouchers. And in many ways, society and the way it has been mishandled is the cause of that. And we want you to be able to come. And I salute these sisters for doing that and working with them. Give them a big hand. And they're going to be moving around the country. They're going to be doing this nationally. And we're going to be announcing it nationally. And I want people uh, to know right here on Saturdays of uh, Ben Crump, give us the information. We'll be announcing it in different cities as you travel because we want to do that. Let, let me say this. Uh, uh, not only is Ben Crump the uh, Attorney General for Black America, but we honor, he hasn't been here since the honor, he's been here often, that he's been chosen by Time Magazine, one of the top 100 influential people in this country. That's a big deal. Give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. Well, we, we are so proud of him, and uh, he has worked diligently and has worked unselfishly. I've worked with a lot of people down through the years, but I've not seen one that has been more committed, unselfish, and takes a lot of flack. Let me tell you something. If you get out of here, you're going to get flack. Amen. You're going to get uh, people that you help that turn on you. Amen. That's why I love Gwen Cobb. Give Gwen Cobb yeah. Eric Gott a call. Gwen, Gwen uh, fought this week with the inquiry on uh, her son. I'll get to that in a minute, but you gonna have victims that turn into superstars. Mm -hmm. I ain't never understood how you have a victim, a relative of yours gets killed, and all of a sudden you Whitney Houston. <laughs> you know, I, they got press agents and advisors, and you a victim, you ain't a leader, ain't nobody following you. We are about the cause of you. But they start thinking that they are the new Fannie Lou Haney. And Ben just goes on through it like it's normal. Amen. And then you rarely get a family in our community that ain't fighting. Mm. And you got to take sides of the fight. 
cousins they ain't seen in 30 years show up. And they got to continue. And Ben got to deal with all of that. Then don't come with the civil suit. And they're going to be some money. Then we go into Sanford and Son. And Ben has dealt with all of that. So he deserves everything he gets and more. Because he does it with real balance, not even uh, talking about the lawyers that try to compete with him. Everybody want to be Ben Crump, but they don't want to pay Ben Crump kind of dues. <laughs> Jumping up and down in these airplanes and, and spending all hours of the night, it is not easy. So you only do it if you commit it. And I, I remember when I started getting known and they start taking shots at me, I'd often tell uh, some of our young people in, uh, in our huddle group, in our youth group, it is going to be a subject, you're going to be targeted if you get visible. But an old activist told me something that I always use, uh, Ben, he said that, uh, Red Mal, I read in the paper this week, they was on your case. I said, yeah, they've been attacking me unfair. And I started defending myself. He said, hold it. He said, always remember this. He said, activism is like a sports game, football. Do you ever watch football? I said, every now and then, I'm more a boxing fan. He said, activism is like football. He said, if you are running for the touchdown, half the stadium is going to be cheering you. Half the stadium is going to be cheering you. And the other side is going to be sending their biggest, most muscular guys to tackle you. But always remember, they only try to tackle you if you're the one with the ball. So they never try to tackle somebody just on the team. They run after the one with the ball. So if you see them attacking you, you must have the ball. So you ignore the cheering and you ignore the jeering and you get the ball across the goal line. And I never got that. So every time they attack me, I say, I must have the ball. They don't be wasting all this print if you didn't have the ball. I meet priests all the time talking about it. Red Mal, you always into something. They don't never mess with me. Why would they mess with you? You ain't messing with them. You laying up in the bed eating chocolate chip cookies and milk. Ain't nobody mad at that. But when you stand up and you upset what has been status quo of systemic racism, they gonna fight back. And you just keep fighting and scoring for the people. And that's what Ben does. Now in light with that, uh, Sunday, about three Sundays ago, I was in Savannah and Ben had Marcus Aubrey and uh, the mother of uh, uh, Wanda, uh, both the mother and father of, of Ahmed Aubrey came and met me in Savannah, and we had the press conference, and uh, they invited me to come. This Wednesday, I'm going to the trial with the parents <laughs> in front of Georgia. I committed that I was coming, and I'm going to be there on Wednesday with the family. And I want all of our allies, uh, Ron Saylor, runs our Atlanta office, all of us, we're going to Brunswick. Now, let me say, we're going to support the family and the local activists. Amen. We're not going to supplant the local activists. They've been diligent. They've been out there. We come in to support them. Too many times people be coming in places trying to take over. You come in and get in line and support what's going on. Amen. Now, I, I, I want to add that one of the things that is alarming, that Ben laid it out, I was listening on the radio, Ben laid out this whole late, the, how they started this trial yesterday and what they said. The other thing that you ought to be outright outraged about is you have an almost all-white jury in 2021. 
Y'all be sitting around watching movies like those days was back in the day. Today, you have a 12-member jury, 11 of them white. And the judge said, the judge said that it seems like there was some racial profiling in the selection, but by Georgia law, there's nothing I can do about it. They, they can do it. Which is telling you that the law protects systemic racism. That's why you need a combination of things in order to make things work. You need the street heat, you need the legal representation, you need those in the media, you need a combination of things. When, when the judge said that, I was reading the New York Times, so I called in the uh, other side of the office, get Attorney Hardy to come in, and Attorney Hardy explained it to me, because Attorney Hardy does the legal scholarly work and run the organization. And you know, he interpret all that stuff, breaks it down, because I don't understand how the judge could say it's racism but couldn't do nothing about it. And he says, well, he's banned by law. So once he broke it down, I got on MSNBC and sound brilliant, but really Hardy told me. <laughs> I get, I get my line from Hardy and say, okay, go to your room, I got it. <laughs> but that is a real example of why we do what we do. Is because unless you change the law, that's why we stand on this George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Because you cannot keep going incident by incident you got to deal with the law. Amen. What made the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s historic was they got the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. Civil Rights Act 64, Voting Rights Act 65, mm -hmm. Open Housing Act 68. All of the rhetoric in between don't matter if they didn't change the law. Right. And the Voting Rights Act stayed in power over 50 years. Now we're trying to restore it now. Because all of this that we do, and all you hashtag activists, it don't matter if we don't change the law. I tell a lot of our young folk here now, when we, are, uh, when we started uh, working with Ben 10 years ago, well, it was more than that, 12 years ago, with, uh, with the Anderson case, yes, sir. Martin Lee Anderson. But 12, 13 years we've been together. But if you just go case by case, every case we have fought, Gwen, there was always a crew of, we are the new young grassroots folk. <laughs> and that go with the movement. That happened to Dr. King, Slick got on his case. It happened to every generation. But there was one crew of young folk in Florida. We the new whatever, the Ungawa, Hapu Hubu. Then we got, Couple years later, Eric Garner, new crew. Yep. Then got the Ferguson, new crew. Yep. That's why I don't get all excited with all that, what they talk about, because they do not last. Those, those that are committed will last. Those that are not are just going by what is trending. You cannot build movements by trending, you got to build it by changing the law. Amen. Amen. And a lot of them are excited for the moment. But the activism is when the cameras are gone, what you going to do? Amen. When you got families that got to pay their rent, and you done run them all over the country in rallies and they couldn't do the job, how they going to pay their rent? That's when we find out how serious they are. But if every time something happened, we see you with a GoFundMe page. That's what they mean, GoFundMe, not the family. I mean, let, let's be serious. We're in serious trouble. That's why the other night, Monday night, when we uh, had the 30th anniversary of Carnegie Hall, one of the things, and I'm glad that, that uh, uh, Brother Ponder put out the history, at our 20th anniversary, 10 years ago, 
We had the first sitting black president of the United States speak that night, Barack Obama. At our 30th anniversary, we had the first sitting black woman of any race, Vice President Speak. That's because your sacrifice has made a difference. <laughs> to be able to have the Vice President of the United States and the Governor and the U.S. Senator and the Mayor and the incoming Mayor come and salute your organization is not because you are in the politics, it's because they have to react to what you have done historically and they could not ignore it. That's why God said to me, Good now you doing this downtown Carnegie Hall, that's a huge state. I said, that's why I want all of them to see it. Yeah. Yes, sir. I want to go right into one of what they are elevated stage. Because I want them to understand that it was some little grandmas mm. uh -huh. that got up 7 o'clock every Saturday morning yeah. and put their $2 in the plate yeah. that built this organization for 30 years that it was some that rode cold subway stops to come to 145th Street that now even the president and the vice president of the United States got to recognize what you've done. So you ought to be proud. We're proud. And all your kid folk telling you, you crazy. What you getting up going up there on Saturday morning for? You crazy. What you getting on a bus riding four or five hours of Washington? Yeah. Shopping got you spooked. <laughs> well, you should have took your crazy cousin with you to Carnegie Hall Monday night. Because <laughs> history are going to record those that sacrificed and made change. All you folks sitting home, there's radio activists. You ain't nothing more militant than a radio revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> they're home, they're radio revolutionary. You know, I, I do talk, uh, call-in show five days a week, and nothing more militant than a guy call you during break <laughs> on his job and call and just cuss folk out. <laughs> he white supremacist, blah 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 blah, blah 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 blah, and we all do so much sort of. I'm not nonviolent like you, Reverend. And da 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 da. Then he hang up the phone and go back to his desk. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Radio revolution. Don't go to a rally. Don't go to a march. Don't help support that. But he can just get up and let it all go. But it is those of you that put your bodies on the line and that stand for something, that's who makes change. That's why I've got this book coming out, Righteous Troublemaker. There were people that paid a price that never got the line right. There were people that were there. Martin Luther King used to say, if you call a march and nobody show up, you just going for a walk. Suppose that we had called a march last year. And we didn't get 200,000 people. The reason those pictures are still going over the world is because you came. That's who makes movement. <laughs> so I, I, I have this book coming out talking about righteous troublemakers. Attorney Paulie Murray, you never heard of her, but Thurgood Marshall and them used a lot of her work to do what they did. And that I do a chapter on her, Claudette Carl was arrested nine months before Rosa Parks uh -huh. for sitting in the front of the bus. Exactly. Same arrest, right. but because that she was dark-skinned. Uh -huh. Not dark-skinned, y'all say dark-skinned down south where my mama from. <laughs> they didn't think she was the right image. So I write about her, and I, I write about all that stuff, because I know when y'all, you say I was the wrong image. Fat, the track suit, with conk hair. But I took my conk hair where you wouldn't go. A lot of you tall, slim, high, yellow, afro Negroes were scared. You had the right profile, but the wrong presence. Sometimes God, Derek, could take a crooked stick to hit a straight lick. 
Not a hashtag, man. <laughs> You have got to deal with this. Let me bring you where we are. Right now, last night, late last night, they passed the infrastructure bill. In the infrastructure bill will be monies to deal with broadband because the broadband in this country is certainly segregated by the areas that's covered. So if you do not have, by zip code somebody said, if you do not have broadband and you have a pandemic which we are just slowly trying to come out of and you tell young folk to do your lessons by internet, go viral, they can't get on the internet because they are in a broadband desert. In the bill they passed last night addresses that. HBCUs get monies in that bill. Roadways and highways, the Congressional Black Caucus for to make sure that they are on our side of town. Amen. You want some cities and you most go jump in craters. You almost can tell when you're on the black side of town because your road gets bumpy. That did not happen by automatic. That happened because some of the blacks, including Kamala Harris, was in there fighting saying, wait a minute, we have to have this in the bill. Amen. There's some folk call themselves progressive that are progressing everybody but us. They like to come and give us orders, but don't participate in making sure we share power. The other thing that we're putting in there is that as they do these investments, they need to use some black investment firms and some black folks taking care of what is going to be the financing Amen. in terms of building affordable housing. Well, some of that ought to be going into black banks to deal with those mortgages. Amen. You can't do that if you ain't at the table. That ain't going to get you sexy. That's going to get you something done. A lot of y'all only want what to get you more likes. You talk about black banks, that ain't going to get you a lot of likes on the internet. But that changes history. And that's what we need to do. Now in this Build Back Better, we're going to demand the same thing. And at the same time, as the Vice President talked about the economy the other night, we've got to simultaneously force this voting rights bill now. And if they cannot do it by partisan, they need to carve out and go around the filibuster. They have done the carve out around the filibuster 161 times for judicial nominations, for budget concerns. If you can carve it out to stack the Supreme Court for Donald Trump, you can carve it out to protect our right to vote in Georgia and Mississippi and South Carolina. Washington, as, as they announced, uh, Minister Talik McMillan, our youth director, was arrested with Martin III and this week, so the demonstrations will keep going. I'm going to be doing one. But I want us also to focus on Brunswick. Amen. Because if in broad daylight, with a sitting black vice president, they can have a white jury legally say it is excusable to lynch a black man, John, then it'll tell you where we are. Amen. That's what we're talking about. And I'm telling you that these people have no shame. When they sit up there and in your face tell you that, well, I was just trying to protect my five-year-olds, so I just got me a rope and lynched the first Negro running by. That's all they're saying. And that could be one of your children. 
or one of your grandchildren. And everybody, black and white, one of the things I loved about the George Floyd case is there were some cities we saw more whites than blacks marching. Amen. 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 And let me tell you this. We've got cases we still got to deal with Brooklyn Center case. We got other cases now. We got Dante Wright. We, we have the uh, young man in BB, Arkansas. We do not get in a case and get out. Reverend Toon, our national field director, talks to Dante Wright's family every week and talks to the other families because we don't get in it and leave. That's one of the things uh, Grant wrote in the uh, Souvenir Journal uh, for our 30th anniversary is that we stay with them. They killed our son seven years ago. And when I was going through the airport in Las Vegas, Coming from a convention, when I got the call, Cynthia Davis, who had our Staten Island office, said, they choked a man to death, and we need you to, uh, to deal with this. I said, well, I'm getting ready to get on the red eye. I, I, I'll be home in the morning. She said, no, but his, his, his mother would like to talk to you now. I said, Cynthia, I'm in the airport. I'm running for the thing. Folk taking selfies. I don't know the difference between uh, Trump item or somebody else item. <laughs> And uh, we run up and she said, well, connect in. And Gwen told me what happened. And I told Gwen, I said, you be at the House of Justice Saturday. This was Thursday. Mm -hmm. I said, you be at the House of Justice Saturday, she, and we'll deal with this. We're going to go to Staten Island. Mm -hmm. She came in that morning. And we, went, yeah. and we put 10 buses outside mm -hmm. and went straight to Staten Island mm -hmm. and Mark. And the whole family, no matter what it is, that they were days the media ignored them. We were still there. There were days they couldn't get interviews. We were still there. Then something happened. They got cameras all in their face. You are serious when you there with nobody there. We don't leave families because we do not believe that families are just some props for your career. I remember we out there when, when Ben Crump called and hooked me in by phone into the family of George Floyd, and I told him that we would go to Minneapolis. We went to Minneapolis before the family did, because family didn't live in Minneapolis. Family lived in Houston and North Carolina. I said, we'll go in and try to deal with the issue, because they were looting and rioting there. Come to find out that two of the people that burned down the precinct and all were from the Proud Boys. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that learned on top from the Proud Boys. Yeah. They put the uh, white right wingers hey. in there to instigate yeah. so we would look violent. Right. And you out there trying to rationalize violence when it wasn't even us doing the violence. That's That's right. Right. But you trying to be all hip and slick. Well, we rebelling because of what men? You don't know if we rebelling. Come to find out it was us doing one thing and they were there burning down top. Hello. Y'all have got quiet on me when you get busted. We cannot let our emotions get in front of our strategy. That's why I, lo I love the Garner family. I love uh, the Floyd family. Because the family went up there and sat down with the president and sat down with Congress and said, this is good, but we want the law. They're not getting intoxicated with the flashy lights and, and all of the trinkets. Yeah. Gwen stayed on it and changed the law. There is an Eric Garner state law against <laughs> children. Change the law. we gone. Policemen will know they can't choke hold in New York because this family stood up until the law was changed. And if it takes all we got, we gonna pass this George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. We may be gone, but we gonna change the law. I stood over two minutes.
many bodies and help walk too many mothers to cast them. Then it be about just getting to, I, I don't need to get on TV. I got my own TV show. <laughs> he be knocking you out the way. <laughs> we be doing processionals and funerals. Negroes be knocking you out, almost knock the body out the way of his own funeral. <laughs> <laughs> you posing. This is serious. That could be my grandson. That could be your child. And when is it going to stop? It's going to stop when we stop it. It's going to stop when we get serious about it. It's going to stop when we show that we are not going to let people get elected that does not put our laws in. We put you in, we'll take you out. Because they don't stop. Lecture this week, show you that. In Virginia. They elected a manicured polish, Donald Trump, to be the governor. Yeah. It's only the same guy. And, and we not say that. He ran, watch this, he ran on critical race theory yeah. in the schools. Yeah. First of all, there is no critical race theories in the schools. Critical race theories is taught in select law schools. Yep. about the history of how racism was used to affect the law and the execution of the law. It never was in high schools, junior high schools, elementary schools. But he was able to run on that and created such a poison climate that they were banning the book Beloved by Toni Morrison. And you can't get a more mainstream stuff than Toni Morrison. Amen. But he used these racial dog whistles. So somebody asked me, I, uh, I do Morning Joe once or twice a week, start my show, and they asked me about it. I said, well, let me first of all say this. One, it don't exist. There is no racial uh, 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 theory. There's no critical race theory in the schools. But let me ask you this. This is the same Virginia that fought to keep Confederate statues up. Yeah. 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 That was all right. So let me get this right. You don't want your kid to hear anything about race, but it's all right for your kid to go to the park and play under statues of people that fought and died to maintain slavery. Don't forget, Charlottesville was in Virginia. The Robin E. Lee statue was in Virginia. Don't be telling me about how we passed all of that. We're not past it. When you would sit there and defend racist insurrectionists that fought against the Union of the United States to keep my great granddaddy in chains. So you want a statue of the slave master, but you don't want the story of the slave. I'm going to make you tell my story. Because I built this country and never got paid. I'm going to make you tell my story. Because I made Cotton King. I used Tobacco Road. I held you on my shoulders and made you the richest nation in the world. And you not going to act like you did that by magic. You did it on the backs of my forefathers. <laughs> race taught in the schools because they want to act like just by magic they became the richest country in the world. They want to act like just by some unknown force of nature they got to be this power. They want to act like we are less because we just can't think right. I don't know what's wrong with black folk but if they told the story they understand why we are where we are, why they are, why they are. I'm going to keep telling the story as long as I got breath in my life. Amen. 
and I don't care what level you get, they're going to judge you differently. Porter got me the other night, I started to use profanity rather than profundity. <laughs> So, well, well uh, uh, Reverend, it, it, it's an honor you have Vice President Harris there, but don't you think she ought to be stepping out, doing more outside the president? I said, name me one vice president in the history of this country that you would have seen that to be appropriate. Did Biden step outside of Barack Obama? Did Mike Pence step outside of Donald Trump? Donald Trump said the most insane stuff. Donald Trump told us in the middle of a pandemic to put bleach in our veins. And Mike Pence stood there like he was at attention in school. But when it comes to a black woman that's out there standing up for voting and all, now you want her to act up. Be round Biden, and if she do this, she an angry black woman. And you say she should have never been there. We are not stupid enough to play the role you want us to play. <laughs> and then they go ask me, well, you know, uh, Eric Adams was one of the first members of National Action Network signed the papers when we incorporated. Hardy said we had to have people to incorporate 91. Eric Adams was a cop then, was with us from the beginning. He says, uh, how do you think he's going to handle things? I said, he's going to handle things very well. And if he doesn't, are y'all going to be on him? I said, if he doesn't, we'll say that. I said, but let's not plan. That's what some of y'all got negrophobia, you know. Aside from COVID, the negrophobia broke out. Y'all put more on Kamala and Eric than you do other folk. Y'all already talking about, I ain't taking this from there. He ain't even got sworn in yet. <laughs> but you've been taught self-hate till you beat down anybody that look like you because you're really ashamed of yourself. <laughs> to hate yourself, you fight anything that reminds you of you. I was talking to a lady the other day, talking about we building a museum. Well, I just don't know if we need a museum in Harlem. Y'all gonna be congested traffic. I said, I'm here every Saturday we don't congest traffic. We had this the other night, we had 100 people outside didn't congest traffic. Yeah, well, I don't know if you need to be, I ain't building nothing. We put a museum right where we are now. The only ones that could have gen been gentrified is us. Ain't nobody here but us and the pizzeria and the liquor store. <laughs> but when you hate yourself, you got to find a way to beat up me because you won't stand up to the folks that you ought to be standing up to. You're going to have imaginary congestion and imaginary problems. Be running around Harlem Road, shopping, building a complex, shopping, renting in a complex. But it's easy to take shots at me, because I remind you of who you are. <laughs> Self-hate! And that is why we always had to remember that our strength was that we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, the wickedness in high places. One of the reasons this movement worked is it was always a spiritual movement. And when you are based on a spiritual commitment to fight for what's right, there's a power that you get that cannot be disturbed. You know, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, great Jewish theologian, said, they asked him, what is the most important thing a faith believer should do? He said one word, remember. If you remember what God has done for you and what God has done for us, then you will have the strength to fight anything now because you've already overcome more than you're facing right now. You know, when, when I go through a crisis, a lot of my friends say, you know, I got a particular scripture I read. I like to read Job 
wait for my change to come. I, another one, I like to read Jeremiah, fire shut up in my bones, gets me through what I'm going through. Another one, I like to read where Paul said this when him and Silas was in jail. But you know, Ben Crump, when I go through a crisis, when I go through a controversy, when I go through a challenge, mm -hmm. I don't go to Job no more, O'Neill. I, I don't read Jeremiah no more. Mm -hmm. I don't even go get Paul and Silas locked in jail. Mm -hmm. I get somewhere by myself, mm -hmm. and I hit the rewind button in my own mind, mm -hmm. and I think about what God done for me. Yes. I don't know all that Job went through, but I know what Al been through. I'm not talking about things you read in the New York Times. I'm not talking about things you saw on television. I'm talking about things I went through that I didn't tell nobody. Things I wouldn't share with my best friend. Days I thought I wouldn't get through. Corners I thought I'd never turn. But somehow, some way, God made a way out of no way. That's why when I talk about this God got all power, I'm not guessing about God. I know what God can do because he done it for me. That's why these people run around here talking about we ain't got enough Republicans to pass stuff. How are we going to deal with the bipartisan stuff? Well, I say what Heschel said, just remember. When we got the Emancipation Proclamation, the odds was against us then, but God made a way. We had the strength. We kept fighting. Amen. When we went and that broad versus the Board of Education, the Chief Justice was a Republican. Mm -hmm. Earl Warren from California. But somehow, we was able to break down the walls of educational segregation. You need to remember. That's why in the Bible, when they were lost in the wilderness, God said to Joshua, remember, I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt and broke the bondage, slavery, or uh, shackles of bondage from you. Remember, you didn't get here by yourself. You didn't know how to open up a Red Sea. I opened up the Red Sea. If you stand up, I'll hold you up. Amen. So, yeah, we want to strategize all we can, but there's a point plus strategy where faith kicks in. Amen. And faith is the unknown, but you believe anyhow. Amen. Faith is when you can't figure it out, but you know that God will make a way. Amen. Faith is when you got a pile of bills and no money, but you say he will provide all of my needs. Faith is when the doctors give up. But you say, I know a doctor that never lost a patient. Faith is when your friends turn their back. Faith is when your family deny your name. But you say, I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me now. We come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He never, he never, he never failed us yet. Don't you remember how we were in the back of the bus, but now we went to the White House. Don't you remember when it was against the law to read and write, but now we're raising children with PhDs. Don't you remember when they called us covered and we stood around and said I'm black and proud. Do you remember 